Today I've got a pretty interesting problem to find the arc length of a family of curves that sort of looks like circles. So in particular for natural number n, we'd like to develop some sort of system to describe the arc length of x squared to the one over n plus y squared to the one over n equals one. Notice we could write that as x to the 2 over n plus y to the 2 over n equals 1, but I think writing it this way sort of makes it clearer what's happening for negative values of x and y in that we square them out first. Okay, before we get started on our calculation, let's look at some examples. So for the n equals 1 case, this just collapsed to the equation of the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So I've drawn a circle right here, and that clearly has arc length 2 pi. That's the circumference formula for a circle. This is a circle of radius 1. Then for n equals 2, what we get, well, viewing it like this, we're like taking the square root of x squared and the square root of y squared. That gives us the absolute value of x and the absolute value of y. If we add those and say that we need to get 1, then we get this like square on its side shape, or maybe you would call that a diamond shape. So notice that each of these lengths is exactly the same. We've got symmetry here. And you can easily calculate that each of them have length square root of 2. So our arc length is 4 times the square root of 2, just by geometric interpretation. And now let's like look at the difference between the case if we were to set n equal to infinity versus for large n as n approaches infinity. So we're taking some sort of liberty here with what happens when n equals infinity, but that, I think that's okay just for a demonstration. So if n equals infinity, you can think about this exponent as being zero, and this exponent also as being zero. So that boils down to when is the absolute value of x equals 1 while y is equal to 0 versus when is x equal to 0 while the absolute value of y equals 1. So again, in that case, when n equals infinity, we would get just these four points. But those four points represent a zero-dimensional space, and that has no length, so our L would be equal to zero. And so let's compare that to the case if we were to have large n. So if we were to have large n, that would be like n approaching infinity. And as n approaches infinity, these like little legs will bend in towards the axes. And for super, super large n, it'll look like these legs are the axes themselves. And so that tells us that this limit here would be 4, because we've got the distance between the origin and each of these points, which is exactly 4 times 1. 1 is the distance from the origin to any of those points. Okay, so now that we've done a little bit of exploration, let's look into my, how we might calculate this. And I think maybe our best way to calculate this is to parametrize the curve using the fact that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. And somehow building that out to our current equation. And we can do that by setting x equal to cosine to the n theta, and then y will be equal to sine to the n power of theta. But that makes x to the 1 over n equal cosine theta and y to the 1 over n equal sine theta, which means our equation right here is satisfied once we like raise each of these to the second power. And then in order to draw the whole thing, we'll have to have theta range from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so now we've got a parameterization. So let's maybe put that parameterization in this box. And let's use this parameterization to write an integral that would calculate this arc length. Hey guys, Justin here, and I wanted to take just 30 seconds of your time to talk about our Patreon. Patreon is a really important part of me and Michael's mission to democratize math. It allows us an external source of revenue so that we can limit our advertising here and remove as many barriers to learning as possible. That's why we've set up an initial $1,000 goal to remove all ads on the second channel, Math Major, where we upload course videos to help students with each subject of math. We'd really appreciate your support, and it looks like I'm out of time, so let's get back to the video. 
Now that we've motivated our setup, we're ready to write down an integral which will tell us the arc length of this curve. So let's recall, if we have a parametrization, then the length of the curve described by that parametrization is the integral over the interval that provides that parametrization. And then we'll have the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared, where those are derivatives with respect to the parameter, in this case, theta. Okay, so maybe on the side, let's calculate x prime. And by x prime, I mean dx d theta. So we can do that using the chain rule. So that's going to give us negative n times cosine to the n minus 1 theta times sine theta. So that's because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And then y prime will be n times sine to the n minus 1 theta times cosine theta. And that's because the derivative of sine is positive cosine. But notice that each of those end up squared here, so the minus sign in fact disappears. Okay, so let's see. This is going to give us the integral from zero to two pi, but I'm actually gonna use some symmetry, which we saw on all of our pictures in the last board, to change this from the integral to, from zero to two pi to the integral from zero to pi over two and multiply by four. Because this is symmetric about folding the x-axis and the y-axis. Okay. So then we have the square root of x prime squared. So that's gonna give us n squared. And then we'll have cosine to the two n minus two theta sine squared theta plus n squared. And then we'll have sine to the two n minus two theta and then cosine squared theta. Okay, good. So we can think about the n equals one and two cases as being special cases of this formula because in those settings there are some stuff, there are some things we cannot factor out. So let's maybe do at least one of those on its own. So let's look at the n equals one case first. So in the n equals one case, we get four times the integral from zero to pi over two. I'll actually bring this n squared out, but that n squared is just one, so we don't really need to worry about it. And for n equals one, that cancels. We have cosine to the zero, and then we also have sine to the zero here, leaving us with the square root of sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta d theta. But that's just clearly equal to the integral of d theta given the Pythagorean identity, which gives us 2 pi. In other words, the circumference of the circle. And now let's kind of in parallel look at the case when n is equal to 2. So if n equals 2, we can factor a 2 out of this whole thing. Because we've got 2 squared, we bring it out of the square root and it becomes 2. That gives us something like 8 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2. Plugging 2 in here gives us cosine squared. So we have the square root of cosine squared theta sine squared theta plus another cosine squared theta sine squared theta. So that'll be 2 cosine squared theta sine squared theta. But now we can maybe bring that two out. That'll give us eight times the square root of two. And then we'll have the integral from zero to pi over two of sine theta, cosine theta, d theta. So something like that. But now doing a quick substitution, we can see that the derivative of sine is cosine. So that means that this thing integrates to sine squared theta over two, evaluated from zero to pi over two. And in the end, we get four times the square root of two, which is expected from what we saw before. This is just a really crazy way of parametrizing that line. Okay, now I'd like to point out why this n equals one and two cases kind of stand on their own. And that's because each of those give us a low power of cosine here and a low power of sine here, at least equal to two or less than two. And thus we can't like appropriately factor it out. 
So that being said, now let's look at the case when n is bigger than or equal to 3 and we're allowed to do a little bit more um, factoring and simplifying. Now we're going to look at the case when n is equal to 3. So that's going to give us 4. We've got a 9 there and a 9 there. We'll bring that out. It'll become a 3. Multiplying into the 4, that gives us 12. We have the integral from 0 to pi over 2. And then let's see what's left inside. So if we set n equal to 3 here, we'll get 6 minus 2, which is 4. So we have cosine to the 4 theta, and then sine squared theta, and then plus sine to the 4 theta, and then cosine squared theta, d theta. And then from there, we could maybe factor out a cosine squared theta and a sine squared theta. So let's see what happens if we do that. We get 12, the integral from 0 to pi over 2. That's going to leave us with sine theta times cosine theta outside of the integral after taking the square root. And then inside of the integral will be cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And then we have d theta. This cosine squared plus sine squared is just one by the Pythagorean identity. And we're left with essentially the same integral that we just had in the last case, which gives us one half. So let's recall, this gives us one half. And so in the end, we get the number one half times 12, which is six. Now, before we move on to a general n case, let's point out the picture of this n equals three case is quite nice. So it's this nice thing that looks a little bit like a star shape. I think this thing has a name, but I don't recall at the moment. If you guys recall that name, maybe post it in the comments. Okay, now that we've looked at the n equals 3 case, let's maybe get an integral for the arbitrary n case and at least see what it looks like. I don't think we can evaluate it though. Now we're going to play around with the n bigger than or equal to 4 cases. So in all of those cases, we can bring this n out. And so we'll have this is equal to 4 times n. And then we've got the integral from 0 to pi over 2. Furthermore, we can bring out a cosine squared and a sine squared from both terms. And that's because we'll bring this sine squared out here. And then in this term, this power here is large enough to bring a sine squared out as well, given that we're assuming that n is bigger than or equal to 4. That's why it was important to look at the n equals 1 and 2 cases on their own. Okay, so let's see. We can bring a cosine squared and a sine squared out. After doing that, we can take their square root. But since we're between 0 and 2 pi, we don't need an absolute value there. We didn't point that out before, but that's important. So that's going to give us uh, sine theta times cosine theta. And then we'll have the square root. And let's see what will be left over inside. We'll have cosine to the 2n minus 4 theta plus sine to the 2n minus 4 theta d theta. That's inside of the square root. And I think we could do some change variables to put this into a different form, but I would guess that this has no closed form. And in fact, I bet it's related to something called elliptical integrals, which actually I've done some videos on the channel about elliptical integrals, if you guys would like to check them out. So like I said, this has no closed form, but it's at least an expression for this arc length that we want. And then let's also recall that even though we don't know the value of this in a closed form, we do know the limit from our geometric interpretation before. And that limit as n goes to infinity should take this whole thing to the number 4. So that tells us that this guy right here... So maybe I'll just put a little box over it. It sort of behaves like 1 over n. We see that it behaves like 1 over n because that allows it to cancel this n out here as we take our limit. So like I said previously, I made some videos on elliptical integrals. You might want to check those out now. And there's one on the screen right now if, you, if you'd like to. And that's a good place to stop.